اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم نحمد و صلی اللہ علیہ رسول الکریم تھینک یو ویری مچ آئی وڈ لائک ٹو تھینک آل آف دی پیپل آل آف دی اسٹاف ایٹ دا مرک آل آف دی پرسنز ہیو میڈ اٹ پاسبل آف کورس دا کریڈ گوز ٹو مس سادیا شی از دا ون بیسیکلی دا کانٹیکٹ پوائنٹ تھرو وچ دس ہیپن سو آئی وڈ لائک ٹو تھینک ہر اینڈ آئی وڈ لائک ٹو تھینک آف کورس Mr. Anil, Mr. Anil, who had been in constant touch with me, and all those people who are involved. Thank you very much for, <clears throat> for inviting me and to give a presentation about Islam and the pillars of Islam. Before that, let's start with something that uh, importance of the interfaith dialogue. Of course, the very first thing is we live in a very diverse society here in USA. So it is very important for us to learn and to make people understand that we have to learn how to live with the disagreements as we live in our homes with our parents uh, with our other relatives with neighbors so always agreeing on something is not really possible so we have to learn we have to respect the other people opinion even if we disagree it's all about that they have opinion whatever they want and we have to respect it in a way that it should not be it should not become a point of uh, unnecessary or unnecessary problems between the people so it is very important for us to understand that there are different people with different faith with different understandings with different point of view and everybody has the right to whatever they want to believe in however they want to live uh, by saying that uh, coming to the uh, topic i have to speak a little bit about islam and then a little bit about each of the five pillars so let me start with islam so what is islam Basically, Muslims believe that Islam is a way of life. Islam is just not merely a faith, but it's a complete way of life, which, em- which encompasses faith, worship, ethics, and social norms. We believe that Islam provides a framework for everything. From the time we open our eyes in the morning till the, till the time we go to the bed, Islam gives us instructions about everything. That includes our daily actions, moral conduct, social interactions, and last but not least, of course, the spiritual practice, practices. When I say a complete way of life, let me give you an example. For example, we have a huge debate, like what are the rights of males and females? If the males would decide that, then of course females uh, wouldn't agree. If females would decide that, then males wouldn't agree. So we believe that a divine being we call Allah or call God, he should be the one who should be defining the rights. Same way, what should be the rights of the parents, relatives, neighbors, Other side, how the financial transactions should be done. What should, what should be the percentage of the labor? How the wage of the labor should be decided? Or let's say if two partners wants to do the business. So how we should decide what is the percentage the partners should be decide between them, themselves. And of course, the social norms. Like if I have to go out, should I wear something or not? And if I have to wear something... how it should be, what should be the minimum, stuff like that. So that is why I was saying that Islam is not just a faith, but we believe, Muslims believe that Islam is a complete way of life. Second thing, is Islam a new religion? So no, Islam is not a new religion. Neither it was introduced or founded by Prophet Muhammad. We believe that it is a continuation and culmination of the messages and teachings of all the prophets who, became, who came before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the meaning of the word Islam? See, in Arabic, according to the grammar, most, about 95% of the Arabic words have a root word that consists of three letters. So Islam comes from the root word Salama. In Arabic, it is Seen Lam Meem, that, meaning, that means peace. So Islam means submission or surrender to the will of God to attain peace. And Muslim is a person who submits his or her will to the will of God to attain peace. Next thing, how Islam got its name? Why is it called Islam? The religion is called Islam. If we see, most of the religions, they get their names either from people or places. For example, Jews get their name from the tribe of Judah. Christians, they get their name after Jesus Christ. Buddhists got their name from their founder Buddha. Same way Zoroastrianism after its founder Zoroaster. Whereas Islam is named after what it means, literal what it means, which is submission to God. In Arabic, Islam means submission to God. By saying this, a little introduction of Islam. Now let's come to the pillars of Islam. You might have 
questions in between while I was talking, but I'm sure most of the questions will be answered during the talk only. So pillars of the Islam, we need to understand one thing which is very important. See, pillars of Islam are not the whole Islam. These are the pillar or pillars of the Islam. We can look at it as five main building blocks on which whole building of the Islam stands. So four of these pillars are the fundamental religious practices. And one of the pillar works as the founda foundation pillar or founding pillar, not foundation pillar would be the right word to use. So each pillar represents an essential aspect of belief and worship. And the purpose of each of the pillar is to foster spiritual growth. These practices are followed by everywhere in the world, causing or creating a sense of unity and shared identity. Fulfilling them help Muslims to become a better person. We, we believe that if a person would do these practices, would, would get involved in these practices knowingly and by understanding, they would definitely become a better person. That brings us to the first pillar. The first pillar of Islam is declaration of the faith. In Arabic, it is called as shahada. Shahada or declaration of the faith, as I've said, one of the pillars is the foundation pillar. So this is the foundational pillar of Islam. We can see that this is, you know, the pillar which is like a huge foundation. And on top of this foundation, four pillars are standing. So what is declaration? Basically, it is entry into the Islam. If someone is born as a Muslim, then he's born as a Muslim. But if someone wants to enter the Islam, then Shahada is the primary requirement for anybody to formally embrace Islam. In, it consists of simple declaration, which in Arabic is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Or there is a different, uh, I don't want to say version, but same words, but with some little extra uh, words that would be like Ashadu an, then again La ilaha illallah. وَأَشَّدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الْعَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُ The meaning, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, means that there is no God but Allah. I'll come to that, that why, it is, uh, why the name is Allah. That there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Muhammadun, Muhammad is the Rasulullah, messenger of Allah. And with the extra words, أَشَّدُ أَن, that means I bear witness. So, أَشَّدُ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And then again, وَأَشَّدُ أَنَّ that I bear witness, Muhammad Rasulullah, that Muhammad is, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Another important thing is that simply uttering the words of, of the Shahada isn't enough. Somebody would enter into Islam if they proclaim these words, if they say these words, that's it. Legally, they have entered Islam. However, these words need to be accompanied by the sincere faith and a commitment to live according to the Islamic teachings. This is very important. And uh, once somebody has entered Islam, this is also important to know that if somebody has entered Islam, that nobody has the right to doubt the intentions of the person. Unless that person claims, claims something which is contrary to the basic teachings of the Islam. Shahada have got two parts, as we said, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah or La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. So this brings us to another question that who is Allah? See, Allah is basically the Arabic word for the God who deserves to be worshipped. It comes from the basic word of Ilah. Ilah is the one who deserves to be worshipped. So when we say Al-Ilah or Allah, that means the God who deserves to be worshipped. So in this sense, Allah is not the God of Muslims only, but Allah is the God of all the creation. The first part of the Shahada, which says there is no God but Allah, affirms, affirms the central principle of the Islamic monotheism, which is called Tawheed. Tawheed means the oneness of Allah, emphasizing that there is no deity worthy of worship, worship except Allah. When we say worship, worship does not only refer to like doing certain acts or ritual prayers. Worship means, in Islam, worship means that anything we do in accordance to the order of what Allah has said and on and in accordance to the way how Prophet Muhammad has done it or ordered it, it would be considered as, uh, uh, it would be considered as worship. I'll give an example. For example, let's say I want to drink water. Now in Islam, there is a way to drink water. That you drink with the right hand and before uh, drinking, you say Bismillah. If somebody would do this, it is a kind or an act of worship he has performed and he will be rewarded for that. This is the simplest example I can give. Tawheed, I've said, Tawheed means that absolute oneness and uniqueness of Allah. That Allah is the sole creator, sustainer, ruler, curer, and master of the universe. And this declaration 
emphasize or uh, emphasize the exclusive devotion and submission to the one who deserves to be worshipped that is Allah second part is shahada second part of the shahada is ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu aur muhammadur rasulullah means muhammad is the messenger of allah basically this part is the acknowledgement of the prophethood of the muhammad as the final messenger last and final messenger of allah before we continue we should know what is prophethood what is the importance of prophethood prophethood is the highest status for a human being which is which cannot be achieved but which is given from allah subhanahu wa taala to the chosen people so we believe that prophets are the greatest human beings of all times they don't commit sins they are the most pious people of their time we don't know the names of all the prophets we only know the names of the prophets which are mentioned in the quran which are by name 25 however their prophets which are mentioned in bible so some of the prophets which are mentioned in bible they can be considered as prophets and going another step some of the people who are the, who were the very pious people of their time if somebody claims them to be a prophet we would not say yes or no like we would not confirm their prophet but we would not or we would not also deny that they can be prophet because we have no way to verify their prophet or for example if we see buddha buddha was one of the best uh, one of the uh, best people of his time or if we see the founder of the zoroastrianism and there's so many other people we can name we they they might be prophets of their time but we don't know that we have no source to confirm that now prophethood and then prophet muhammad who is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so final prophet muhammad is the final prophet sent by god to reveal the faith to the mankind he is not the founder of islam as i have mentioned he is the one who conveyed the message of the islam to conveyed the message of the monoth monotheistic teachings which were previously preached from adam till jesus peace be upon them all we believe that adam we believe that ishmael we believe that isaac jesus moses jacob they all come with the same message they all were given the divine revelation so was muhammad he was he received divine revelation he lived his life as a model of piety righteousness and he lived his life in obedience to the allah's commandments god's commandments and his teachings provide guidance for all aspects of life that brings us to next thing that what is quran quran as everybody knows is the sacred book or the holy book but basically quran is we believe is the divine revelation quran is the literal word of god which was revealed to prophet muhammad through angel gabriel and it was revealed to him in the span of 23 years we believe that it is the complete and perfect guidance for all the human kind regardless of their religion if anybody would read quran with the sincere intentions of seeking guidance he will definitely get the guidance and we believe that quran provides ethical principles as well as laws which are called sharia laws in arabic sharia law is basically islamic law the translation of the islamic law and we believe that quran contains verses of knowledge wisdom quran also contains the stories of prophets and everything in there is for the guidance is for the salvation is for the spiritual growth and inspiration basically it is to make a person a better person to work in the society understanding the significance of the quran can help foster respect and definitely interfaith dialogue coming to the second pillar salah salah normally the word which is used in english as a translation is prayer or worship but uh, salah is salah you know i mean like there isn't any perfect word in english to translate but however it is uh famous as the word prayer so we will keep it as the word prayer so salah is or prayer is the most important act of worship in islam as soon as anybody enters islam that's it it becomes obligatory on the person it is performed five times a day and it is compulsory for all the muslims it is a direct connection with god we believe that when somebody prays basically he is in direct connection with god and those persons they express their gratitude they seek spirituality and before anybody has to pray they have to wash themselves which is called wudu wudu is basically procedure for washing body parts using water in a certain steps or in in preparation for the prayer in certain way uh, there are five prayers which are obligatory first is fajr that is at the time of dawn before sunrise second is called as zuhr 
that is in the noon time. Third is called as Asr, that is afternoon time. Fourth is called as Maghrib, that is after sunset until dusk. And fifth is Isha, that is that starts after suns, I mean at dusk until uh, the dawn, until the time of the Fajr. There are some extra prayers like Friday prayer. We pray every Friday and uh, that is prayed instead of the Ruha prayer. And then there are other prayers like on the prayers on the Eid. And there are some other prayers as well, but let's stop here. This is like the important part. Where do we face when we pray? So Muslims must pray facing towards the Kaaba. Kaaba is the square box which is situated in Makkah. We, we must understand that Muslims do not worship that place. Muslim, Muslims do not worship that square box. That is the direction in order to pray. For example, let's say somebody don't know where is the direction of the Kaaba. They must try their best and then they pray. And let's say still they would made an error, they made a mistake and they pray somewhere else. They were facing somewhere else and they pray. So their prayers will would be still valid. This is one of... Uh, the arguments that we do not worship, Muslims do not worship Kaaba, but Kaaba is a direction for us to pray. Second thing, what is masjid or mosque? Mosque, masjid is the Arabic word for mosque. Masjid or mosque is a place of worship, similar to church for Christians or synagogue for Jews or temple for Hindus. It's a place where Muslims perform their daily five prayers in congregation. However, masjid is also used as a community can also be is generally used as community center as well it is used for religious classes lectures social gatherings charitable initiatives to support those in need so a masjid can be used as a muslim community center for multiple purposes and one more thing that masjid is not just a physical structure but it is a spiritual and communi communal hub for muslims are non muslims allowed to enter masjid Definitely, yes. There is nothing in Islam which prohibits non-Muslims to do not enter masjid or do not come to the masjid. However, of course, if anybody would like to come in, they, it's a good idea to check beforehand and uh, to dress modestly. Of course, it's a holy place like any other places. So the dress code needs to be followed if somebody come. Anyhow, in our masjid, if somebody would just come, we have some extra, uh, you know, coverings. We can always provide. That's not a problem. And I think most of the masjids in USA, they have this thing. And now let's go to the third pillar. Third pillar of Islam is called zakah. Uh, it is translated as mandatory charity. Zakah is a word which is derived from the Arabic word, which means purification or growth. It is an act of worship and it is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God. In Islam, it is seen as a form of purification of one's wealth. It is a mandatory act of charity and it is expected from every Muslim who have certain type of wealth. I'm not going to go into details of the wealth because that is uh, a topic in itself. However, to make it simple, anybody who have a savings of 85 grams of gold or more and one lunar year has passed on that saving, then he needs to pay 2.5% of that saving in charity. And... To whom it would be given? It would be given to the people who are in need, poor, needy, homeless, orphans. It can also be given to the people who are in debt, who are in debt and they cannot get out of it. It can be given to the travelers who are stranded without funds in a place where nobody knows them. It can also be given to the institutions who are working for the benefit uh, of the people. Uh, significance of the zakat. Basically, it is to ensure that the people in need are taken care of. This is the basic, basic idea of the zakah. And of course, it fosters a sense of unity and social responsibility among Muslims. And it reinforces the importance of helping others. This is very important because in Islam, it is not only about praying and doing other acts of worship and not taking care of the community we are living in. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention about the community in Islam uh, because it is there. See, in Islam, when it comes to community, the basic unit is not a person. In Islam, the basic unit is not individual, but it is duality. In Islam, the basic unit is duality, that is husband and wife. And if we see, Islam gives a great importance to the community in different aspects. So zakah is one of the pillar of Islam, which is a mandatory charity to make sure that the community is taken care of. People who are in need are taken care of. 
And of course, it is also, we believe that zakah is also the way to purify one's health, uh, one's wealth, whatever he has. It's a way of acknowledging that whatever we have is given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the zakah reflects the Muslim's commitment to compassion, generosity, and social responsibility, and acknowledgement of God's ownership of the wealth. Whatever we have is given to us by God, and we have to use it as God, Allah, and His Messenger have told us to do. Because once you die, everything remains here. Nothing goes with you. Everything remains here when you die. So this means that it is not yours. You have been given to use it wisely. Now, let's come to the fourth pillar. Fourth pillar of Islam, fasting. Just about 13 days ago, there, this was, there was a month of Ramadan. So fasting basically means abstaining from food, drink, and sexual activity in general from the time of dawn, that is from the time of sunrise, before sunrise, until after sunset. Muslims fast in the month of Ramadan, that is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. And every adult Muslim has to fast who is sane. People who, can, who, should, uh, who are exempted from fasting are the people who are sick, travelers, temporary, they have to make up their fast later on. Pregnant women, they don't have to fast, they can also make up their fast later on. Elderly people, if they cannot fast, they cannot fast. They have to do something else, I'm not going to do that right now. Reasons of fasting. Reasons of fasting, it is clearly mentioned, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ For spiritual growth, to become God conscious. So abstaining from the worldly pleasures, the aim is to achieve spiritual growth, to achieve deeper understanding of ourselves. If that is not happening, means something is not right when a person is fasting. Other thing is, of course, gratitude. Fasting can cultivate the appreciation for the blessings of food, drink, good health which are often taken for granted by people. And of course, it is a way for discipline and self-control. What happens during fast or how we fast is we wake up before dawn and we have a pre-dawn meal that is called suhoor. And then we break the fast after the sunset and that uh, meal is called iftar. And it is a month where we pray extra. You all must have heard, I want to go for taraweeh. People, they pray extra after Fajr prayer. They recite extra Quran. And uh, they also do extra acts of charity and worship. Let's come to the fifth pillar, that is Hajj. Hajj is an Arabic word which is basically pilgrimage to Mecca. It, is, it has to be done at least once by every Muslim who is physically fit and financially able to do it. If somebody is not able to do it financially, he, they do not have to do that. When is Hajj? Hajj is during the last month of the Islamic calendar, that is Dhul Hijjah. That is the 12th month. And it is the annual pilgrimage. The Hajj commemorates the rituals that is performed by Abraham, peace be upon him, and his family. And of course, it is basically the unity of all the Muslims. It symbolizes the unity of all the humanity in worshipping the one true God. It gives us the message of equality and unity. All of the people are wearing the same clothes, white clothes. It creates a powerful sense of equality before God and it is a way to self-purify ourselves. it is a way to seek forgiveness it is a journey to the self-purification it is a chance to seek forgiveness for one's sins and of course it is the challenges the challenges people have during uh, the Hajj is are seen as opportunity for the spiritual growth and strengthening the faith at the end, uh, at the end, or during the time of the Hajj, there is a major festival called as Eid al-Adha. By the way, we have a major festival after the end of the Ramadan, that is Eid al-Fitr. So, at the end of the Hajj, it is Eid al-Adha. It is a major Islamic celebration. Uh, it commemorates the willingness of Prophet Ibrahim to sacrifice his son Ismail as an act of obedience to God. Uh, the celebration involves the sacrifice of an animal. By the way, which never happened. Ibrahim did it, but God replaced his son with a sheep. So Muslims do that as well in uh, commemoration uh, or in uh, the Sunnah of Ibrahim al -Islam. So the celebration involves the sacrifice, the sacrifice of an animal, which is usually a sheep or a goat, and then we distribute its meat to the poor. Uh, I think, I'll, I'll, yeah, that is all what I wanted to say about the five pillars and, and a little bit of introduction of Islam. And lastly, I would like to involve, uh, involve I'm saying, I'd like to invite Every one of you, whenever you feel like, our masjid is open. You're all welcome to 
attend our Friday prayers, uh, sermons. You can, of course, listen to the sermon. You don't have to pray. That is not uh, because we are open to everyone. You just have to, uh, if you are just passing by and you feel like coming in, feel free. It's uh, on Fridays. It is open and uh, you're all are always welcome to do that. With this, I uh, open the uh, session for question and answers. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Imam. So before we go ahead and do the questions and answers session, Michelle, would you like to present your slide about about the prayer room? Oh yeah, the prayer room. Uh, okay, see, this is this is a good thing what you have uh, uh, mentioned about the prayer room. See the importance of prayer room. Why it is important to have a prayer room, and you know, regardless of what religion is it. See, we all go through ups and downs of our life. Everybody, there is nothing called as perfect life. And we all always need that inner spirituality to connect with God. Even if you'll see the people who, who call themselves uh, that they don't believe in God in any way, even they have some kind, some kind of connection with the things. Probably they would say that I believe in science or I believe in X or Y or Z. That's, that's not the topic, but just let you know that we are born with this instinct to get connected to a higher spiritual being. It can be anyone. In our case, like when I say our, I mean to say, you know, people who believe in God, in their case, it is God. And they all have their own ways of connecting to God. So I think the prayer room is a place where a person, you know, can go in. And when a person should step into a prayer room, he should just get rid, try at least, try his best to get rid of all the, uh, you know, worldly thoughts, all the worldly problems. He should just get in and he should feel as if he is entering the sacred place where he is going to get connected with God and then when the person gets connected to God in whatever way the person wants to get connected whatever is the religious way then the person should talk to God you know see prayer room is basically talking to God you talk to God you let him know what are your problems you let him know that you are blessed with whatever ways then you let him know that what you are seeking it can be guidance it can be a troubled time where you are going through and you're looking for some peace in your life it can be some spiritual problem you're seeking so basically prayer room and and you know i cannot insist enough on that to have that prayer room in every facility wherever it is possible and uh, people should go there People should read whatever their religious book is. People should try to connect and understand that religious book because through the religious book, whatever uh, religion a person is following, they always have something, some religious scripture and they believe that this religious scripture is a way to connect to God. So whenever somebody wants to connect to God, they have to read their uh, religious scripture or their uh, religious prayer with the condition, this is very important, with the condition of understanding what they are saying. Because we see that some of sometimes a person is very religious. For example, in case of Muslims, a person goes, prays five times a day, 30 days a year, he fasts, he gives a lot of charity, even he has been to Umrah, that is another uh, act of worship, or for Hajj. But at the end of the day, people would say, you know, instead, in spite of being so religious, as a person, I am hesitant to contact him, or I want to keep my distance as a person. Because this is where the difference between the person's spirituality and the way how he deals with the people comes in. So I think prayer room should be the place where a person gets in. He gets in connected. He gets in connection with God through the prayer or the religious scripture or however he want to do it. And then he reflects. He should. The person should reflect upon what God wants from him as a person. And then you talk and, you know, uh, so in this way, I think prayer room should be there in, in every facility and every person should spend uh, some time in that room. And before you go into that room, make sure that you know what you want to do in there. Uh, if you'll just go in there uh, without any plan. Uh, and so, you know, anywhere, if you go without any plan, then, of course, you will be confused that what you should be doing. So I think um, this is what I want to say. Wow. Okay, everybody's on silent, so I don't know if anybody's speaking. Michelle, would you would you like to present this slide now? Sure. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. Uh, yes, I can. I can see your screen. 
Okay, so real quickly, this was um, uh, information that came out, I think it was in March, um, and here at Elkton, we're kind of a work in progress with uh, what we call our quiet rooms, which used to be no formerly known as interfaith rooms, and if you travel throughout Merck, um, I suggest you go to, to quiet rooms on Merck.com, and you can see where quiet rooms are available at every Merck site, um, which would be very helpful, but currently, our quiet room is available in Building 89C, and you can reserve that on Outlook. Uh, we do have one coming, hopefully, in Antibiotic and Building 5. And we're working, um, uh, my group, the Interfaith uh, EBRG, is working with the Occupancy Management Group. And um, we'll provide updates as we we have them uh, for availability of other rooms on site. And if there are any questions or concerns or if you want to reach out and let us know um, if you need anything in the interim, um, please reach out to myself or Jamie or Mike Berkey or Teresa Wood. Um, our contacts are there on the screen or um, occupancy management that's overseeing this project. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Okay, I'm going to be opening the floor to some questions and answers so the imam can answer them accordingly. Okay, so the first question is, what happens during the Ramadan period, and what can we do as an employer to support those who celebrate Ramadan? Okay, it's, it's, it's a good question. See, basically, fasting is a very private act of worship. If I'm fasting, I don't really have to let people know I'm fasting because that is between me and God. Uh, but of course, you know, as, a, as, as an employer, if, if there is uh, something you can do uh, for the person or you want to do for the person is uh, maybe you can ask them that, uh, I mean, or uh, I'll put it this way, to give them some extra time for the prayers if they want to. But of course, you know, I, I at the same time I have to say that the person should not take advantage of that. He should not be unfair to his job because he will be answerable for that as well because it's a favor the employer is giving to the employee. So probably this is the general thing you can do, you know. Or uh, let's say, um, I don't know if it happens here or not because normally one in Muslim countries what they do is that they reduce uh, certain hours uh, on, you know, during the prayer time or during the month of fasting. They reduce uh, certain hours from their work and then maybe later on the person can you know do some extra hours to for for the uh what is it called the uh, extra concession they had during the month of ramadan but of course it totally depends on how the company works but but there is uh, if you ask me anything special no i don't think there is anything special uh that can be done or should be done during the month of ramadan Okay, okay, and anyone in the audience, if you, if you want to have any questions, feel free to type in the chat, and the imam is more than happy to answer. Uh, you and I would like to add, you can even ask me questions after out of topic if you want. If you think you would like to ask me any questions out of the topic, I mean out of the Islam, uh, pillars of Islam, in general about Islam, anything you think, you know, you need to know, I would be more than happy to answer. If I don't know, I don't know. I'll let you know honestly that I don't know. Thank you, Imam. I really appreciate that. And so the second question coming in, the, the person has read, thank you so much, Imam Jahir. What do you believe are the most pressing challenges facing black immigrant Muslims in the United States today? And how do you think the community, the community can address them effectively? Okay, see, this is uh, basically this question I, I really cannot answer because it's, it's specifically about the black immigrants. Uh, first thing. Second thing, it's about the government policies. Uh, so I think this question is really out of my jurisdiction, you know, because it has got nothing to do with Islam. Basically, it has got to do with the people who are living in the country and people who are following the laws. However, in, in general, what I would like to say is, you know, that um, we, we must understand one thing. We must understand one thing that we have to do what is right. Whatever, uh, you know, phase of life we are going through, we should understand that we always have to do the right thing. Uh, regardless of uh, what other person are, what other person is doing, you know, you, we have to take the legal ways to address the issues, to address the problems. And uh, other thing I want to say is, you know, that there is nothing called as hundred uh, percent. What is it called? Uh, satisfaction. 
you know, no matter, I'll give you, for example, you know, uh, let's say a person who's a CEO of the company, you know, even he will have his own concerns and his own uh, things to say that this can be improved or that can be improved. And if we come down to the least, you know, the person who is like at the uh, bottom most place, even he would have his concerns. So, you know, when it comes to these things, uh, there will always be challenges. There will always be things we're not satisfied with. There will always be rules and regulations we wish were better. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have to stick to what is right. We have to stick to the laws. We have to uh, follow the law of the land, what it says, because that's the only way to keep the peace. We need to understand this because at the end of the day, peace is the most important thing we need to, you know, uh, keep in the community, in the society. And also, I would like to say, you know, uh, because there, there are a lot of happening, there are a lot of things happening around the world. So without, without naming anything or going into the details, we need to understand one thing, you know, that sometimes it takes only one or two wrong decisions to destroy everything the whole community have created. So we have to be very careful, you know, we have to be part of the community before we take any step, which we think is right. You know, we, we have to be careful uh, b before what we think is right. We go ahead and do it or say it. And then later on, whole of the community uh, have to suffer before, because of that. It can be black community, African-American, as we say, or it can be, you know, any other uh, minor community, Chinese or Muslims or, or Indians or for the sake, you know, any name. So I think in general, this is all what I want to say, because it's, it's a very particular question about a very particular community without going into, uh, into any details. Thank you, Imam. And going to our next question, what are what are the Friday prayers you mentioned, Imam? I have never been to a mosque and feel this is a great opportunity. So, very first thing, you're always welcome to join us on Friday. Our English sermon starts at one o'clock, and the prayer starts at one thirty-five. So you can just come in. You can uh, sit and watch what this Friday is all about. Basically, Friday is a prayer, which we pray like any other prayer. We pray like, you know, Fajr, Zohar, Asr, we, we pray the same thing. So Friday prayer consists of two parts. The first part is sermon that goes for about 25, 30 minutes. And the second part is about praying, where we pray in congregation. And that's it. Okay. And... Uh... Imam, I have a question of my own I'd like to ask you. So, you know, you mentioned what that there was a specific word if you want to convert to Islam, right? There's a specific word you have to say that you immerse yourself into the religion. And what you also said is not just about saying the word, but it's also about fully believing in it and it really saying it sincerely. How would you describe as someone being sincere and being and being particular about it? That's what I want to understand. It's, it's, it's a very good point. It's, it's, it's a great question. It's a very good point. See, there are two aspects of any religion, you know, like any, any, where any religion, it, there are always two aspects. One is legal and one is technical. Like if anybody wants to enter into any religion, there is a legal way of entering. If you take the example of Islam, in Islam, the legal way of entering into Islam is that you uh, say, the, say the Shahada, you declare your faith by saying there is no God but Allah and there is uh, that Muhammad is the last and final messenger of Allah. Basically, you believe in all the previous messengers as well. If somebody would say this, legally the person has entered Islam. If we look at the technical aspect, technical aspect means that only saying from your tongue is not enough. If you have just said from your tongue, and you don't believe in your heart what you have said, or you don't live your life according to what uh, you ha you believe or uh, what you claim to believe. This means it's basically a, a contradiction between your sayings and your doings. So if somebody has become Muslim legally, that's it. Legally, he's a Muslim. Nobody has any right to, in to doubt the intentions of the person. That is the legal aspect. Nobody can question that. Anywhere in the world, if he says, I'm a Muslim, that's it. The person is a Muslim. However, there is an inner self where inside a person knows if he has ravely embraced Islam or reverted to Islam or is if he has just done it for the sake of any uh, benefits or, you know, or because uh, he is going to a Muslim country where if he will say that he's a Muslim, he will get more benefit, for example, if he has done it for this reason. So there are two aspects. One is legal. Legal is for people to know you know it will be written on the certificate or maybe on the passport or maybe you know it will be written in the record that he's a muslim but the technical aspect of course nobody can judge that that is purely between that person and god so i think this is i hope this answers the question okay 
Okay, and, and I have another question for you, Imam. Is you were mentioning that that when, when, when Muslims do prayer, right, they have to be facing the Kaaba, which is in, in Mecca, right? Um, is there a specific reason? So you're saying that the Kaaba is more of a, a directional guide than, than, than a specific object that we pray towards? Is, is that what you meant? Okay, so, okay, fine. Why do we pray facing towards Kaaba? Basically, it is to form the unity. Like anywhere a person is in the world, it can be east, west, south, uh, uh, north, anywhere the person is, to have the unity that where should we pray, where should we face while we are praying. So the Ka Kaaba becomes the Qibla. Qibla in Arabic means direction. So the Kaaba becomes the Qibla and to form the unity, we face towards Kaaba and pray. First thing. Second thing, what is the significance of the Kaaba itself, the, the place itself? So we believe that this is the first house of God, which was built by Adam. And then it was revived by Abraham. And then it continues from the day of, you know, the Adam came to world till now, it is still there. It is a square box, as you can see. It is not made up of black stone, but it is make up, made, made up of, you know, general stones. I'm sure you can find the pictures on the Google now. It is very easy. It is covered with a black uh, cloth. It is covered with a black cloth. As long as is there is is there anything holy about the thing? So if we say in like technical terminologies, no, there is there isn't anything holy about it because there were times when this was broken to rebuild. Uh, there were times when you know the flood came and the whole thing was you know uh, destroyed or was destructed and it was built again. So Kaaba in that sense is not really holy. And if you see. Uh, sometimes people would even climb on top of that when they are changing the cover of the Kaaba they would even climb on top of that to change the cover so in that way in that aspect the Kaaba is not holy place or holy thing which we worship it is holy in a way that because it is mentioned as a house of God it is it is there situated in the house of God and it is a direction for Muslims to pray and then um, this is this is what is all about it I hope that answers oh, the question. Okay, th thank you for, for, for answering that question. And I'm going to be, there's some more questions coming up. Sure. Okay, here's the next question, Imam. Thank you, Imam, to you for a really meaningful and impactful conversation. To educate our colleagues about the communities around us in, in the we, we have, what are the demographics of, of your community members in which countries they are representing? Wow, that was a very technical uh, terms the person has used. Kindly make it a little simple. <laughs> can can you repeat the question? I think I I, I got lost in where, you know, in somewhere. Yes, uh, let me repeat it again. I'll, I'll, I'll try to show it a little bit. To, to educate the colleagues about the communities around us that we are currently in, what are the demographics of your community members, which countries, in the countries they are representing? Okay, in Harrisonburg, uh, we have uh, most of the people from uh, Iraq and we have most of the people who are refugees because I'm sure uh, most of you know that Harrisonburg is basically called as capital of refugees. Most of the refugees, when they come in, they come into Harrisonburg. And then from here, when they are settled, <clears throat> they have their paperwork or whatever they want to do. Uh, not many, but few of them move, but most of them, they decide to stay here because once you know you come any place, when you come, you are settled there and your children are going to school or you've got a job, then it's difficult to move. So in Harrisonburg, most of the people are from Iraq uh, and most of them are basically from Kurdish, uh, what is it called, uh, background or uh, from Kurdistan. And we also have some Arabs and we also have some Pakistanis and there are few Indians as well. So this is what the community is in Harrisonburg. The community is all about. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah, I think that should answer the question. All right. And this is for the chat. And anyone else has any any last minute questions for Imam Shahir? Uh, yes, Imam. Um, this is Karen. Really, thank you for. Um, introduction the five pillars of islam this was really educational uh, and that's what exactly we wanted to uh, uh, kind of learn um, and uh, same time there is uh, like some details i mean 
more like you know with the prayer room like things that uh, uh involve like for example you know you, you need to like wash your foot before entering the prayer room right like small details like that or like a uh, woman and men cannot be in the prayer room same time right like small details like that i think that's something we kind of, we we don't know that we also relying on uh, you know conversations like this step and so we'll educate ourselves and you know we'll do all the initiatives they are there for good uh, you know, make sure we're providing the space, but also we need to be like meaningful and uh, strategic before or even, you know, moving forward and like, okay, there's some differences within the religion too, right? Um, so so my question is uh, what kind of like initiatives that uh, like happening outside of uh, here, like in the Harrisburg area, you're thinking like in the future we can collaborate, like participate. This is just the beginning. We invite you, you know, over and we want to continue this and you know choose the topics too. But is there anything, you know, happening that you would like to see like us to collaborate or anything in your mind? Yeah, definitely we can do that. Definitely we can do that, of course. Uh, let's, uh, we will, you know, uh, uh, um, it's, I think we should do that. I think we should do that. We should always, you know, talk to each other, collaborate, any uh, questions we have, anything like, as uh, you mentioned about the prayer room. Uh, in, in general, there are a lot of details about the prayer, uh, how you pray and about males and females praying together or not together or, or sharing the place with other uh, faiths. The, these all questions, of course, you know, they, they require more uh, detailed answers. Uh, but of course, we can work together, you know, uh, I'm, I'm open to answer any questions. You can always send me questions on my email and, and I would answer that. Or if you'd like to invite me over there for uh, for a gathering to address the gathering, definitely we can do that as well. So, yes, uh, we, we, we should do that. We should continue. We can plan on, you know, on, on the, I mean, according to what we need. Definitely, I think we should do that. Yeah, and uh, I like the question that Lisa was asking in the chat um, about, you know, what it will take for someone who's not uh, uh, Muslim, right, to actually uh, visit the mosque and be there like on a Friday, like doing the prayer, what are the special requirements? And nope. you mentioned that uh, you do have the coverings, right? Is That's there anything else? Nope, there isn't any special requirement. Honestly, you can just wear, uh, uh, what is it called, you know, uh, a long shirt, you know, covering your uh, elbows, long shirt and it's not really skin tight a trouser which is not really skin tight and uh, we have a cloth to give you to cover your head but if you'd like to come with the hat that's perfectly fine and you can sit in the uh, prayer hall with other ladies as you know that we have separate place for the ladies uh, you can sit in there you can listen to the sermon and uh, if you have any questions you can ask me after the sermon basically after i finish the prayer and there are no really any uh what is it called the uh, uh uh, objections or no, 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 objection is not really the right word. There isn't any restrictions. That's the, that's the right word. There aren't any, there aren't any restrictions for non-Muslims or ladies or, or gents to come in. However, for the ladies, uh, of course, another extra thing would be we're all adults here, you know, just to make sure that they're not going through their, uh, their special days of the month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. And, and Imam, this is not a question, but this is a comment. Uh, she is saying thank you, Imam Zahir. This is really educational, and I very much enjoyed hearing you speak. Thank you for the generous gift of education. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the good comment. Thank you very much. All right. And any other more questions for Imam Zahir before we close this session? Okay, well, thank you so much, Imam, for coming, and I really appreciate your time communicating beforehand, and this has been an excellent presentation. Thank, thank you so much. Thank we, you we all as well. really appreciate it. Thank you all as well. Thank you very much for attending. You all guys took your time out. You know, you sacrifice your uh, time for eating and, and having some social interactions. So may God bless you all for that. May God give you the best, uh, bless you all with the best of the blessings. And may God take away all of, all of your worries and problems. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Imam. Jazakallah khair. Barakallahu feek. Hayakallah. Assalamu alaikum.